the Civilian Conservation Corps employed uh, 2.7 million people over a period of nine years, maxing at 300,000, provided lots of really good job skills for fellas who were used to working in camp conditions and were like, you know, we don't mind working in camp conditions, but we want to know that there's going to be a guarantee of shared labor. We want to know that there's actually something for us to do, that we're improving something, that we're making our communities better by doing this. Then we're willing to live in the camps. And so the Civilian Conservation Corps started. And I, I look around now at population um, of unemployed vets and the unemployed civilian population, and I, it just dawns on me. We've got, this park could use thousands of hours of maintenance. Oh yeah. It's innovative and it's a good little bit of historical background. That, so, so that people think that Franklin Roosevelt started the Civilian Conservation Corps and it was some socialist deal. Mm. And uh, it clearly wasn't. Oh. I'm Tom Allen. I'm uh, a, a veteran of the the Army, I served uh, in the Vietnam War era from 1968 to 1971. I was in the Signal Corps um, and uh, served in Vietnam during 1969 and 1970. Um, and uh, that certainly gave me uh, a different perspective on the world, I think, than many of my non-veteran friends. And so perhaps I could relate some some of that. I was sitting in this last session, which um, had to do with uh, titled Beyond Transition, and we had Sharon Ferguson, who's a planner from Anchorage, kind of leading what turned out to be a group discussion. I'm sitting there thinking about, why am I here? You know, why am I in the midst of all of this? And it goes back to January of 1971, when I mustered out in the Army at Fort Lewis, pardon me, at Fort Monmouth. And uh, I lost a family uh, at that time. You know, I, there was a, a sense of camaraderie. You know, I had guys I'd worked with closely for the previous, I mean, going on three years uh, and and we'd become pretty tight you know I think anybody who's been in a TO and E unit probably recognizes what I'm talking about you know you you work together you sleep together you eat together you march together you joke together you drink together and all of a sudden that was gone and I'm back in the world after the Vietnam War, and shit, nobody gives a damn about me. In fact, at the time, it was worse than that. I was a pariah. So it was a big, empty, emotional hole in my life. And it took many years to fill that. And I think that my involvement in the permaculture community in the last decade I've finally begun to rebuild that sense of a family um, in an environment where we're all working together for something. You know, back in the day when I was in the Signal Corps, we were working together for something. We didn't exactly know what it was, but we knew we had a common purpose. Mm -hmm. and. You know, maybe we didn't buy into the main purpose of our lives was to get Charlie. I think the main purpose of our lives was to see that that our fellow soldiers were safe to the extent any of us could be. So here we are now, you know, 40 years on. It's been, what, 40, 41 years and going on 42 since, since I left the service. And, and we're, we're again working to a common purpose. We've got something, and that is the three 
essentials of permaculture, the care of the land, the care of the people, and sharing the surplus. And, and I think I can say without any reservation that the people that I have come in contact with in this environment share that, share those goals. What kind of projects are you doing now and what, uh, what kind of participation roles are there for folks that may be just getting out or have gotten out a few years ago and kind of looking for a way to plug back in? Well, I think the first thing that you have to do, really, is to find yourself. And that's probably the most difficult. Many years on, after a process of struggle, you know, kind of emotional emptiness, the, the VA got me into a, it was a scientific study program on mindfulness meditation mm -hmm. for post-traumatic stress sufferers. And I think that really helped me to kind of gel this issue of, of finding myself and, and being confident in myself and kind of understanding myself. And that, that daily discipline of meditation has been a great benefit. Because I, I think that if you go looking for yourself in the reflections from other people, you're constantly in fear of disapproval of, of others. And it really compromises your self-confidence. And, and I think to function well in the world, you need that same self-confidence that you had as a member of a group, as a member, uh, as a soldier, that's one of the things that military training strives to do: is to build that sense of, of self confidence. And it's so easily destroyed and so difficult to reconstruct. But you need that to function in the world, and you need that to be involved in any of the the projects that the permaculture community is doing or any of the sustainable communities are doing because you're constantly assailed from the mainstream uh, with doubts that create self-doubt you know I mean the, oh you guys are a bunch of nutcases oh that's a conspiracy theory you're just a bunch of conspiracy theorists well it's like Naomi Klein said in a, one day when I talked to her, she came flogging her book on a book tour, and I said, geez, I, you know, don't people call you a conspiracy theorist? You know, she, it, she's talking about the role of the, the CIA and, you know, mind-bending in the population of the U.S., and she said, well, conspiracy, yes, theory, no. They left a paper trail a mile wide. Hmm. And she has that self-confidence to say, I know whereof I speak. I researched it, I got 70 pages of footnotes, and you're not gonna fill me with a bunch of doubt because by calling me a conspiracy theorist. And, and, and so the root of the sustainability movement is to say that there's something seriously wrong, and it's in the interest of the mainstream society to perpetuate itself as it exists today and to do that they're going to it's just inherent in the way society works if you're if you're not going along with a program the the people who are part of the program are going to say well you know you're getting a little wide of the mark here you know you might want to look at yourself and 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 see you know why do you think these sort of crazy things and you really need that sense of self, that self-confidence, to to be able to to stay the course. So in the, it sounds like in the work that you've experienced that uh, a lot of what you had to go through is you know, recentering and re-understanding who you are in the context of a new environment. As veterans step forward and they uh, 
begin to look at sustainability and um, different kinds of projects that they may be interested in, it sounds like you suspect there's going to be a lot of side work that has to go on in addition to the yard work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you get, I mean, this is not to say that you have to do one and not the other, but you can't neglect what we in the permaculture movement call the invisible structures, the internal structures, you know, the things that guide your life, uh, the spiritual aspects of, of, uh, of your own personal being. And, and, and that might be uh, as a part of an organized religious group, or it might be just your own uh, relationship with the cosmos. Who, is a, who am I to say? It's different for everybody, but you you do have to have to pay attention to that uh, as well as looking at the world that we inhabit, the green trees and the built environment, the highways and the buildings and so on, um, and and say, hmm, okay, well, what do I really think about this? And what are people who are experienced in this movement? What are they telling me? They're telling me that there's some things that are that we really need to change, and and they have you know the interesting thing about the permaculture movement, which is kind of the a core of the sustainability movements. I think what that what they're saying is that we have a set of solutions, is a, a set of design principles that really address most of the ills uh, that you face in the world, be it, uh, you know, the, the weeds in your garden or the, 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 the weeds in society. And some of society may think of the veterans as weeds. You know, I certainly uh, uh, experienced that back in the day. When you look, I, this, it's interesting. I like the, um, the notion of the weeds and the idea um, that there's a self-reflective process that is important in addition to the work. And I'm wondering through, um, through application of the principles and ethics of permaculture, have you been able to get a more refined self-reflection and understand where your motives and your obstacles are more deeply through, I mean, because often we think about the patterns and principles as being something we apply to a physical environment. Um, but have you found that there's uh, places where looking at those has helped you self-reflect and, and see yourself more clearly in the mirror? Yes. And what it's done for me has changed my focus from one of kind of victimhood in a way. Uh, I'm a victim of an, uh, an uncaring and not understanding society to one of being proactive and looking at solution models and seeing how implementing those solution models really brings a, a, a visible change. and and the growing self-confidence that comes along with, with doing those things, seeing that positive change, getting a sense of self-worth and a sense of warmth and success out of that. Uh, so I come to realize myself as being somebody who is proactive in the world and can have an influence on people around me. I'm, you know, I, this late date in my life, realizing that people do listen to me. And, and there's a certain responsibility that I've re recognized, and that is I can't just run off at the mouth without thinking about it, because particularly amongst the young people, geez, they believe almost anything I tell them. What kind of effect do you think the veterans can have in the work that we need to do uh, to bring resilience to our communities? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that most veterans uh, 
went through military training that gave them skills that aren't readily or aren't gave them skills that aren't generally distributed throughout the population, particularly anybody with a technical MOS. You know, uh, the days when the quartermasters uh, repaired boots are gone. Now that sort of stuff's been outsourced, but uh, people have training in software, they have training in um, um, aircraft mechanics, um, truck mechanics, and, and most of that stuff is transferable. Those, those manual skills in particular are directly transferable the pieces of, of those skills. If you, if you take a, a skill like, let's say, an aircraft mechanic, he has to know about hydraulics, uh, he or she now, I guess, uh, electrical systems, DC and AC electrical systems, uh, metal work, uh, you know, how to repair. If he's an airframe and power plant mechanic, he's got to know about each of those things. And I found that in in my own case, that all those skills, if you take the individual pieces of them, you can put them together in new ways that give you a leg up on most people that just have an academic education. And that includes just people that went to high school because, you know, the traditional manual skills are no longer taught in schools. And that's something that's a crying need for. Uh, the backdrop here is people making solar cookers. This is a pretty low-tech but very innovative use of some pretty simple skills and simple understandings like like uh, how does re how do things reflect? How does sunlight reflect off of shiny surfaces, for example? Uh, you know, anybody that's uh, had a deal with with uh, um, aiming systems for like for artillery or uh, is going to understand, or radar, for example, is going to understand angle of incidence, angle of refraction. And that's what these little cookers are all about. And, you know, beyond that, you need to use a pair of scissors and a paint roller. I mean, Linda has uh, a pretty uh, innovative product she comes up with with relatively simple skills. But there are other things. Um, if we look over to our right, we see... If you want to pan right there, we see a, a geodesic dome that old Steve Tracy uh, has built using hubs that he cast himself out of old beer cans. Well, he learned how to cast aluminum. Here's an example of something that uh, veterans probably have a leg up on. A lot of what goes on here to this weekend is outdoors. And uh, camping out for any soldier is no big deal. You go on bivouac, you know, or this, in the this field. Is, this is a bivouac with a couple hours to sleep in, and somebody feeds you a decent that's meal. That's right. You know, I mean, this is a pretty deluxe bivouac. Uh, but you know, that said, uh, you know, we're all used to, um, you know, being without creature comforts and not caring that much or suffering that much. Um, there's another uh, example. Um, now, we just experienced a park-wide power outage. Uh, power hasn't come back on yet. We didn't know when it will. Uh, but uh, guys that, that have some experience with electrical power understand how power systems work. You know, there's an opportunity. You know, we got one guy here that I know was a retired lineman worked for one of the big Midwest utilities. He's not going up a power pole today, but he wouldn't be too far away from figuring out, you know, where the source of the trouble was. And, you know, but when mealtime comes and it gets dark, there's going to be some good bit of innovation that's going to have to happen here. And, uh, you know, GI's uh, been in the field in constantly changing circumstances. There's no predictability to it. You got to roll with the punches. And so many people in the civilian population, if you any little perturbation, aside from the whining about it, you know, 
any veteran is going to say, what? Don't sweat the small stuff. But aside from the whining, they don't have a clue as to what to do. And you get into this environment with a bunch of people who have kind of studied this sort of situation, they, they at least have a mental framework for how to pick the problem apart and come up with an innovative solution for it. And, and, it's, and there's another aspect where, where GIs are, are going to have a leg up on a lot of people because they are trained and experienced at rolling with the punches, at expecting the unexpected and dealing with it. And if you can get yourselves involved in, in emergency preparedness, it would be a great entry point. It's considerably more mainstream and it, it probably is an easier access point maybe for for veterans who, who uh, you know, don't have any experience with uh, ecology or sustainability. And one of the things that the permaculture movement, and particularly the transition movement, which is sort of the organizational wing of permaculture, if you will, is doing, is beginning to engage the emergency preparedness folks to get them to think in terms of more than three days. Mm. It reminds me of an interview I did some years ago when I was uh, doing uh, radio stuff with some survivalist type people. And he had a, I don't remember, it was K rations. It was before MREs, I think. And he was reading the label and it says, two men, four days, four men, two days. After that, he says, you're on your own. And most of the emergency preparedness people are assuming three days. Mm -hmm. And I, if a serious, if, if we had a breach of one of the upriver dams on the Columbia River that took out power to Portland, and I don't remember who told me, it was somebody from PGE, Portland Gas, said it would be a, as much as two years to get power back. And so I brought this up to one of the emergency preparedness folks and they said, well, yeah, we know about that, but if you're not prepared for three days, you sure as heck aren't gonna be prepared for two years. So you gotta start somewhere. Yeah, you have to start somewhere. And I think that the body of veterans and even active duty military, well I shouldn't say even, but also active duty military people uh, have the capacity to deal with long-term emergency situations. And imagine that this power outage that we're experiencing this afternoon was region-wide and was not going to be fixed anytime soon. What would we do? And who would be I called on to while. do it? <laughs> I might too. I can think of worse places to be. Except I don't have the infrastructure systems that I have at my own home True. to support me. I have food growing year round there. I have backup power mm. to maintain freezers. Uh, I have dried food that I put up this summer, canned goods. So, you know, I could go for an indefinite period of time without power, but not forever. And that's that's a big part of what what the permaculture movement is about is is to be able to function in an environment where you don't need the very complex, centralized, and brittle. Uh, infrastructure. So I think that people with a military background really wouldn't be particularly challenged by that sort of situation to have a good idea of what to do. Whether you could get the rest of the civilian population to understand that and to go along with it is another story altogether, you know, and I don't have answers for that. Guys gave their all, literally. Some of them didn't come back. Some of them came back in pieces. Some of them came back physically attacked, but mentally in pieces. And it's our responsibility as older veterans, I think, to help those guys put themselves back together. And I think this is a way to do it, to get involved in 
in uh, ecological restoration and sustainability and emergency preparedness. And I think there's a lot of opportunity. And there's a lot of need, too. Uh, we may not be able to get the political class to, to sign up to it with money right away, but we keep at it and the need becomes clear to them. There's a ready-made a ready-made crew of willing and able people to help. I believe so. Do you have anything else that you want to add to this? Anybody that you'd like to give props to or things that you'd like to put out into the, the world? Never give up the fight. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, Tessa. My pleasure.